this is great to have such a stellar panel of uh, speakers and also you know, officials from different organizations, students, researchers uh, who have joined us for today's discussion. So on the occasion of International Day of Women and Girls in Science, uh, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to welcome everyone on behalf of DST Center for Policy Research and UNESCO New Delhi uh, for this very interesting panel discussion on feminist perspectives on science and science policy, which aims to examine how diverse perspectives of feminist science and STS can provide an alternative to the dominant thinking and accounts in STI, and also try to indicate ways to abridge the gaps which exist between the philosophies of feminist science and science policy, which indeed are very relevant for India and also in other parts of the world. So as I said, uh, we have this wonderful panel of experts, Dr. Geeta, Dr. Asha, and Professor Banu. Uh, so we'll have a small panel discussion with them, followed by a Q&A session, wherein the audience can pose questions. And we hope that this insightful discussion will be a great learning for scholars, researchers, and policy practitioners engaging on issues of gender, intersectionality, development, sexuality, to name a few. With further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ben Obor, who is the program specialist and lead of the natural sciences sector at UNESCO New Delhi, to give his remarks and set the stage for today's discussion. Over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nimita, and uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening to, to everybody. Um, let me also just use this opportunity to thank Nimita very much for her recent achievements in supporting women in science in India, of which we will learn more during my uh, uh, speech, but also more in the next weeks to come. So thank you very much, Nimita, for that. Uh, distinguished panelists, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the 22 commemoration of the International Day for Women and Girls in Science, uh, which is just a month before the International Day of Women, which is the 8th of March. Since about two years, science issues have become themes of public discussion everywhere around the globe, really. Uh, because of COVID, of course, ranging from infection curves and recovery ratios, the patterns of zoonotic transmission of viruses and the development and production of vaccines. And we've been all exposed to that. Now, historically, women have been underrepresented in scientific fields. If more women would have participated, however, especially in science employment and entrepreneurship, the global science-based response to catastrophic events like COVID-19 would have been much stronger. And the same thing, of course, is also true for other catastrophic events that we have right now, like the loss of biodiversity, the climate change issues, air pollution, plastic pollution, environmental degradation. I would like to challenge everybody with a little bit of an, of an aggressive question. Imagine we would have less men and less women in science. Imagine we would have no men, no women in science. We would lose so much. We need both. And we have probably fairly enough men, at least on the on the science employment front, on the jobs, but we need especially more women, uh, especially more on the job. At UNESCO, we have produced an innovative report on Indian women in science, and some of you here have assisted us one way or the other in producing this. It's almost ready. This report aims at better understanding the complex issue of gender equity in the science in a way that inspires action within India 
and India, of course, as a giant uh, geographically and by population, uh, undoubtedly will inspire many other countries in the world then, so it will have global impact. The report will be launched on the 7th of March 2022, not so far from, from now. Uh, on the eve of International Women's Day, which is the 8th of March, uh, and those of you who wish to be invited, uh, please contact Nimita. Of course, we will send you invitations and it would be our pleasure to have you with us. The key recommendations of this report call for multi-stakeholder engagement to promote gender inclusion in the science workforce, in academia, government, and in the private sector. Society must better understand the benefits to society given by women in science and the complex fabric of issues related to visible and invisible gender biases. For the seminar today, a range of experts will share their diverse perspectives and opinions. I hope the discussions will spark a renewed interest in the topic and assist to my, make science for and with everyone. And I hope that we can improve our mental model of women in science globally. I would like to sincerely thank the Center for Policy Research of the Indian Department of Science and Technology and the Indian Institute of Science for jointly organizing this event with UNESCO. I thank the eminent panelists for their generosity of making available their time and expertise and all the participants for joining us today to celebrate women and young girls in science. Thank you, Benno. Thank you for setting the context for today's discussion. And uh, with this, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sachira Dipta, who is a senior fellow at the School of Public Policy, IIT Delhi, to welcome everyone. Over to you, Sachi. Thank you. Um, thank you, Nimita. Uh, and a very good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone, depending on from where you are joining from today. Um, it's a privilege for me to welcome you all to this um, panel discussion today on behalf of the CPR, uh, DST CPR at IESC. Um, as part of the STI Policy Fellowship, the STIP Secretariat, um, uh, we engage in policy research and advocacy, um, and we have been doing it uh, for the past few years throughout our, in, in the past recent uh, past in our careers. Um, and I think we can, I can confidently say on behalf of my colleagues as well, that at various points of uh, our research careers and in our engagement with various stakeholders, we have always felt the need of understanding the sociocultural, the temporal, the spatial context of science, um, of technology. And recently, in the last year, when we were engaging with uh, a wide range of stakeholders, uh, starting from academia, uh, to science policy, science and policy practitioners while formulating the STIP uh, policy or STI policy 20, draft STI policy 2020, uh, we had felt the need um, a lot more as well. Now, I personally work in the intersection of climate change and agriculture. And again, I'm reminding every day, especially when working with the farmer, farming community, I'm reminded, reminded every day how important it is to understand the challenges and the opportunities um, of the, of the farming community and also the solutions that we put forward um, through the lens of gender, through the lens of intersectionality. But unfortunately, that discourse is not really as mainstream as it should be. Um, and that's why um, I thank Nimita for actually um, uh, organizing this panel discussion today. Um, and I believe it's an opportunity, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to learn a little more about how feminist, uh, sorry, uh, about how uh, feminist perspectives can be integrated into the work that we do um, and also into understanding the technological changes, the socioeconomic changes and transformations that are happening. With that, um, I won't take any much any more time today um, and hand over the mic to Nimita back again. Um, again, welcome, uh, a warm welcome to all of you uh, and I hope it will be as 
fruitful a discussion as I'm looking forward to and as it would be, as it would be for me. Um, so yeah, with that, over to you, Nimita. Thank you, Suchi. Thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, we are all good to go and uh, pretty excited for the panel discussions. Uh, I see people joining in uh, from different walks of life. So let's uh, begin today's discussion. Uh, the panel discussion will be co-moderated with, uh, um, I'll be co-moderating it with my colleague, uh, Dr. Debanjana Day. And uh, so, so let's begin. Uh, if you're okay with uh, it, Dr. Asha, shall we start now? Because I see we wanted to do Dr. Geeta first, but uh, I think she is having some I'm, issues. I'm here. I'm here, Namita. Oh. I'm here. Oh, you're going? Okay. I managed to join through my phone. Yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry about this. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Geeta. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining. So, um, uh, so this is great. So we all, uh, all the three panelists are here. I'm happy. I was a little <laughs> nervous uh, that we'll miss uh, Gita, but I'm glad she has joined. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I invite uh, Debanjana to take over the floor and initiate the panel discussion. Over to you, Debanjana. Thank you, Namita. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Thank you uh, for joining us today for this discussion. I once again welcome all our panelists uh, for joining us today. Uh, our first speaker today is Professor Geeta Chadda. She is a faculty member at Department of Sociology, University of Mumbai. Uh, her research focuses on science studies, feminist theories, and post-colonial studies. She has been working on feminism and science for more than two decades and has written extensively on these uh, themes. Uh, apart from research and publication, she is also credited to have designed new courses on feminist science studies and have been actively involved in organizing capacity building workshops uh, on gender studies. Today, she will be talking about problematizing the social construction of the genius and the consequent ideas of creativity that dominate scientific cultures. She will also talk about how feminism and feminist science studies have moved into intersectionalism and what it needs to be taken to uh, be incorporated in science policies and processes. So I welcome you, Dr. Geeta, over to you for your... Hi, Hello. Uh, good evening, yeah. everyone. Thank yeah. you. Good evening, um, all the organizers, Namita, uh, my co-panelists, Vanu and Asha. Uh, it's nice to be here, but I firstly must apologize for this goof. I thought I was going to do this on Google Meet and realize I don't have a team and all kinds of things. Anyway, in effect, what that means is that I did have a PowerPoint, which I'm uh, too flustered to really figure out how to uh, show it now. But uh, yeah, and also sort of I've sort of... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, not not necessarily stayed with the, what I sent to you all. I just thought I'd lose a, a sort of a brief and quick overview of the field. It might take me uh, 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 some time to do that. And um, as it has panned out uh, globally and in India. So I normally, uh, you know, have in the last few years learned to start this um, kind of an introduction to feminist science studies with uh, Rohit Vemula's suicide note of 2016, where he says that uh, I love science stars nature, uh, but then I love people without knowing that people have long since divorced from nature. Uh, our feelings are second hand handed, our love is constructed, our beliefs colored, our originality valid through artificial art. It has become truly difficult to love without getting hurt. And I think this sentiment is very, very crucial to the kind of uh, interventions that uh, we as feminists uh, do when we look at uh, the culture and practice of science as to how to restore, uh, 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 you know, a science which is probably based on uh, love, connectedness and the idea of justice and freedom. Yeah. So uh, let me quickly do a... Um, 
uh, brief uh, uh, background on what is feminist science studies. Very often, uh, it's very difficult to talk to people of a subdiscipline and a subfield, which is, uh, you know, actually quite marginal and becomes quite niche, unfortunately. So it's a field of study at the intersections of what uh, we know as science studies, uh, which is a field that looks at science today from uh, multidisciplinary perspectives of philosophy, sociology, history, anthropology, psychology, and literature. And uh, it's uh, feminine science studies is at, uh, at the intersections of science studies and women's studies, which is another little field that you see in the academia, which means doing uh, and looking at all disciplines uh, from a gender perspective. Uh, from uh, life worlds of women presenting critiques and uh, alternatives actually to uh, the way a mainstream disciplines actually theorize uh, gender. So a field uh, like feminist science studies, which is at the intersections of two actually pretty marginal fields like science studies and feminist studies, uh, or women's studies actually has been uh, quite a, a challenge to develop. So FSS looks at science from feminist perspectives. Yeah. So now this word feminism or feminist often gets into uh, um, a knot with uh, several practitioners of science and of course others also. So I'd say that it simply is a, a way of looking at things from a uh, by using the lens of gender. Uh, but also from the standpoint of women and women's worlds and, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, highlighting how uh, women experience and understand uh, the world around them. And um, in the contemporary feminist perspectives that we have evolved, all of us know that the idea of woman itself is quite destabilized now, and we would not talk about woman as a a homogeneous subject of feminism, and we would bring in more intersectionalities of class, of race, of caste, of sexuality, to bear upon our discussions on um, uh, on 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 uh, in Ephesus. Yeah, uh, and uh, so uh, I mean, I'm very often asked, what does really Ephesus entail? What does it do? So I'd say that uh, we'd all agree on saying that it entails an identifying an endocentric bias in the discourse of science, uh, but science as a social institution with its specific subculture, science as methodology with its ontological and epistemological assumptions, not only about the study of uh, sex and gender, but also largely of nature and universe at large. Third, as an institution of modernity, uh, implicated in and with society and as a system of knowledge with its own theory. So I think we sort of engage at all levels of looking at science from a feminist perspective. Now, uh, historically, and even today, we often see this, that uh, it, it has changed. It is changing. But feminist science studies often has a very uneasy and difficult relationship, say, between women practitioners of science. Uh, and uh, feminists who do science, um, uh, one is because they are very afraid of being labeled and called feminist because it leads to a certain kind of ketoization, which uh, uh, we need to sort of really engage with as to why that happened. But I think also there is a deeper question about because feminist science studies pushes the envelope quite a bit uh, to asking questions about the nature of science, not just about inclusion and representation of uh, women and uh, other marginalized groups in science. And this doesn't sit very well uh, with women in science. But today we are going to hear uh, from both Banu and Asha, which will be uh, exactly, prop, you know, I'm anticipating will be about uh, how do uh, feminist practitioners of science, how have they, uh, uh, you know, redefined or, or, or let's say reinterpreted uh, aspects of science. So how did uh, Ephesus begin? So as Evelyn Fox Keller, the American scholar, says that, uh, I mean, when she's talking about Ephesus in the global north and how it de developed, it was basically probably uh, to, you know, what needed to develop, she argues, is that science studies as a discipline first needed to develop. 
which means that uh, the inputs from you know, critical social movements had to come in to challenge and question science, whether it's the environmental movement, whether it's a women's movement, whether it's a, 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 you know, a critical race movement. And then, of course, also within the social sciences and the academia, the entire uh, paradigm of what we know as positivism had to get challenged before uh, really a feminist science studies could develop. So the critique of science is sort of developed in, uh, in the academia around the 60s and that became an important uh, uh, ground, preparatory ground. She also suggests that feminism itself had to mature because feminist theory had to sort of move from understanding you being, you know, uh, explaining how you and I get constructed as gendered subjects, how our relations uh, as gender subjects uh, get constructed in patriarchy, but to be over, also be able to use the idea of gender and examine uh, cognitive and imaginative spaces like science and maybe even art. But I've also argued uh, that in India, uh, the third thing that needed to happen was we needed to critique the kind of uh, uh, development paradigms that we had, uh, the basis of which was a certain kind of science. Till we actually began to do that, um, it was not easy for feminists. Even today, actually, it's very difficult for feminists to really understand and critique science. And of course, a marking textbook, uh, a marking contribution that happened in this direction was uh, in uh, Science Hegemony and Violence, edited by Ashish Nandi, which had some remarkable essays in the critique of science, uh, including one by uh, uh, Vandana Shiva. We've moved great deal from there and we sort of problematize the kind of alternatives that were presented in that volume but as a critique it still is quite a remarkable one uh, i'll quickly um, identify four registers now, i think that on which feminist science studies develops i think first register is on looking at participation of women in science and representation of women in science one major thing that we have done here is a methodological shift in explaining this low and differentiated participation of women and other marginal groups in science. Now, what do I mean by that? Simply that often when we have to answer this question of a low representation of women in science, or why are women more in biology and less in uh, uh, physics, or why are there more women in uh, uh, gynecology, and not so much in, you know, in cardiology. Um, the, 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 the old paradigm of explanation would often be that it's the dual social role, it's society, you know, as if um, science is not a part of society. So what we have done effectively is try and shift the uh, uh, lens to science itself and make science and scientific institutions and cultures as a unit of analysis to examine what is going on there uh, to explain the low participation of women and, and other marginal groups in science, which means, of course, that we see science as deeply, deeply embedded within society and also reproducing social structures and social hierarchies. And second registration it register that we work with is theorizing and reimagining the you know gendered ontological assumptions in science about nature. I will not be talking about that too much here. And third. A register is about critiquing the uh, epistemological assumptions in a scientific method of the separation between the knower and the known, uh, which is the only way that we perceive as uh, as reaching a certain objectivity, neutrality, and universality. Yeah, and of course, the last thing that we continuously strive to do is to uncover the endocentric bias in scientific theories themselves and how they are produced. I would say uh, that. I don't know whether Asha would agree with me, but I would say that in India, in our context, we've we've had we are, we are we are really progressing at a snail's pace. Yeah, we are making inroads into discussions on how to increase participation of women in science and other marginal groups. In the last twenty years, we've seen a lot of that happening. Yeah, uh, and in the last five years, uh, the intersectionality has uh, you know really brought in uh, tremendous voices from um, uh, on the question of caste on the question of sexuality. and But on the nature of science question, I think we are still working 
very very slowly because i think the 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 uh, 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 critique of the nature of science has to come from the practitioners and i think the bridges between uh, the practitioners of science and us is being built fairly slowly yeah but uh, we are very very optimistic so um as i was saying that one of the reasons that we uh, uh, we find uh, and i will stick to the low participation of women in science today and try to suggest uh, uh, give an overview of how we look at it um so as i already said that it's science and not society that we look at as a unit of analysis yeah uh, the other thing is that we often encounter this um, uh, pressure from both the state and the scientific community of uh, producing role model literature you know to say that we have to have role model literature for young girls to enter into science and if you look at the kind of role model literature we have it's and it's some of it is it's been very very important to do lilavati's daughter was a classic that had to be done and it was very uh, necessary but what happens in these kind of role model literature is you set up this what i've been saying is that we set up this heroine narrative you know of the uh, of the of the woman who who trans you know who fights all battles and struggles with everything of course who has a supportive family etc etc and then she does fantastically yeah so what we want to actually um, debunk is this heroine narrative and properly produce material uh which is far more closer to the reality which is very very complex and very different so in for example that's what asha and i try to do in the uh, uh paired narrative that we produce of eight women in persons in science where uh we encourage them in their own voice to write about what they have faced as discrimination you know because 20 years back also a lot of women in science would still say no 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 science is merit based scientific cultures are pure and neat and clean the problem lies with something else probably with ourselves probably with the social uh, you know society at large today situation is very very different and a lot of women practitioners of science have begun recognizing that uh, the problem lies with science if they don't get funding if they are you know not being given promotions if they don't get to uh, uh, you know freely choose uh, whether they want to be uh, caregivers along with being great scientists or not yeah so um, and the other the, the, so so the other thing third thing that we do as uh, uh, in order to understand this question of low participation of women and is i've seen a lot of discussion uh, recently in uh, the, you know uh, uh, we, we see how our languages are borrowed also you know this whole question of mentoring has started becoming a very big thing you know how do we mentor younger women in science and a lot of women practitioners are devoting uh, a lot of time actually on this question and uh, i i see that uh, the kind of things that we uh, uh, the kind of issues that have come up i think are four one is the dual problem of preparing them for the hard world of science and yet teaching them how to navigate it with confidence and energy i see a lot of women practitioners working with that you know it is a hard world now you you know we know that but how do we prepare them and build their confidence a lot of good work goes on there then how do we provide networks because one of the biggest problems that we find is old boys club and you know uh, women cannot access networks and resources so how as women in science uh, groups have started looking at this idea about how do we uh, uh, um, help women young people develop networks and build cultures of support and care within scientific institutions and this happens particularly when there are instances of sexual harassment uh, that we encounter yeah and then uh, there is also this question which a lot of women in science who are talking about mentoring talk about how to perform or not perform femininity so the pr pressure of you know uh, being the woman performing femininity through the way you present yourself you know and how not to perform that and how to yet perform that i mean if there's time we can go into this um, uh, later now i i i i mean i think i'm taking too much time nimita you have to tell me uh, but i'll end with uh, with my you know the work that i have been uh, i've done but i haven't talked about enough because i just 
continuously keep thinking that the community so you know there are three constituencies that we address the stem constituency the social science constituency and the women studies constituency so this question of genius is a very interesting one and i think if you really look at the history of the idea of and as many other things we inherit this notion from our western modern masculine uh, paradigm of who and what constitutes a genius yeah and so this in in all our ethnographies we will find with the scientific community you find the prevalence of this idea of the genius and how this genius gets constructed you know how these genius is a, a socially politically historical creature and how this genius is actually uh, you know should be therefore you know nurtured and everything should be made available no social responsibility uh, absolving of all social responsibility still exists still exists now um what was considered to be in pre modern times in say western societies which is something like an ability genius is not really in, was not associated with the individual talent you see how it gets slowly associated with individual talent but more dangerously with innate ability yeah and this idea that uh uh you can be good in mathematics so you can and this is also a notion that we see in our deeply caste societies deeply brahmanical societies that you know uh, you do uh you you are great um, at mathematics you are great at music you are great at you know anything uh, uh which is ex- you're exceptional because of innate ability and this is something that i think we need to problematize because i think this comes on and off uh, quite a lot within policy discourses also that encourage talent encourage innovation you know so this notion of talent needs to deeply deeply be questioned because it's a notion which is one of the biggest hurdles that i find in the full participation of women in science because of a variety of reasons uh uh you know firstly women don't have the time to you know become a historical and a social and a political and a, a all that yeah they're deeply embedded in the kind of life worlds that they live in um so uh, to to become the genius from those life worlds really requires a lot of genius yeah so anyway so i'll just end by saying that we've also been tied in a very deep polemic uh or in 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 feminist uh, uh circles and understandings between uh, how do we talk about critique of science from a gender perspective without actually falling into the polemics of the right and left yeah uh, how do we not i mean how do we keep our critique of uh, a certain kind of uh, right agenda uh, very very central uh you know why we do our feminists because the critique of science is coming from everywhere just as the appropriation of science is coming from everywhere yeah so being able to carve uh post 2014 and post basically a lot of uh, uh the trend that we are into to be able to carve a space for feminist science studies critical feminist science studies has been a challenge and i think it's becoming more and more of a challenge but the optimism comes out of the fact that i think it is man it's on board i mean there are lots of there are so many events having happening today that i'm actually upon but thank you so much <laughs> i'm sorry i just didn't have the the ppts so i was lost maybe maybe we can share it with the participants of, uh, at a later stage I, uh, yeah I, Thank you thank you uh, professor geeta for setting the context so well because i believe that as much as we discuss about uh, increasing representation or retaining women and all somewhere which is which also has a lot of issues when we look at it from a feminist perspective uh, we have not really reflected on the idea of uh, the nature of science per itself as how inclusive it is supposed to be so thank you so much for setting this context and uh, uh with this we call upon our next speaker uh, dr asha achutan she is a faculty member at the advanced center for women's study tata institute of uh, social science mumbai and is uh, also the chair of women and gender development cell 
Well, uh, Asha was uh, initially trained in medicine from Kolkata University. However, for her higher study, she picked up women's studies and cultural studies, quite a diverse background. And uh, her current work uh, uh, kind of exposes the context of gender and biomedicine with a focus on um, feminist uh, epistemology critique of the same. Uh, she has published in the area of gender diversity in science education, feminist and standpoint methodologies, and uh, a lot of work uh, on interdisciplinarity in higher education. Her interventions in today's discussion will focus on norming technologies in the clinic in contemporary Indian context and how a particular crafting of binary gender is occurring via these technologies in, in the present uh, situation. Um, as an extension to her talk, she'll also highlight what a perspectival form of medical training might do in response to these. With these uh, uh, few lines about your work, Ash Dr. Asha, we hand it over this virtual mic to you. <laughs> over to you, Dr. Asha. Thank you, and please do call me Asha. I'm most comfortable that way. So uh, thank you, Nimita and colleagues for this uh, kind in invitation. And I would also want to say that I'm honored and a little terrified, as I said a little earlier, to share this space with two people whose work has both uh, inspired and directed my own in part. So I work and teach in the area of uh, feminist science and technology studies. Part of this work has been about uh, exploring feminist critiques of biomedicine and histories of the same in the Indian context. I come to this conversation primarily from an investment in understanding the changing clinical space and the manner in which how body, disease and gender are framed change in this space. Um, I've been trying to articulate how the clinical dialogue um, uh, remains a multi-sided and multilingual one, even as the idea of the expert domain is produced and consolidated. Following this, I'm interested in calling for a refocusing on protocols of clinical work to see what a critical feminist focus on the nature of this dynamic and the expansion of this dialogue can bring to the idea of the democratization of knowledge as also healthcare. So what I'd like to share today is some thoughts broadly emerging from a study that I led between 2016 and 19 among medical practitioners, students and allied professionals offering a variety of services, including gender affirmative services to persons in non-normative gender sexuality locations in public and private healthcare. Uh, we also engaged with health activists and feminist queer organizing during the same. The idea was to trace the appearance and journey of gender sexuality as a metaphor. In Sorry, were you saying? I, yes. I, believe, uh, I believe we are able to see the team screen itself, not your PPT. So maybe... I haven't, I haven't shared anything. Okay, so I don't know from where it's coming. It happened from somewhere else. I was also wondering what's up. I don't know. <laughs> It's Christmas, yes. but yeah. so, what, there's nothing that I can do really because it's I all right. done anything. It's someone else's screen, I believe. I, I don't know who is. Uh, so who, somebody else has done a screen sharing, is it? It uh, looks like. But anyways, you continue. We'll deal with this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, I mean, uh, like, I'm, yeah, so what, what I'm saying is that what I'd like to share uh, today are some thoughts that are broadly emerging from a study among medical practitioners, students and allied professionals offering uh, a variety of services, like I said, including gender affirmative services to persons in non-normative gender sexuality locations in public and private healthcare. We also engaged with health activists and feminist queer organizing. So the idea was to trace the appearance and journey of gender sexuality as a metaphor in medical text and practice, and to explore the terms of legibility and entry of marginal lives and experiences into mainstream healthcare. Uh, the study was actually proposed at a time when, uh, which was just after the uh, 2013 Supreme Court judgment, which reversed the Delhi High Court judgment of uh, reading down of Section 377 of the IPC. Uh, and in that sense, it was a climate of disappointment. But uh, NALSA, the Supreme Court NALSA judgment on gender being a matter of self-identification had also just happened in April 2014. 
and there was some talk around the need to develop a you know sort of propose a law against discrimination in that time so that was the context but by the time we concluded the study of course there was a like a veritable discursive explosion around lgbt inclusion uh, more visibly in the shape of a call to identify a new constituency that must be spoken for and included Although there were already strong voices asking for acknowledgement of heterogeneity in medical communities uh, by then. So what we were able to do is study the protocolization work in process, so to speak, in the clinic and policy in Indian contexts. By protocolization, I mean the building consensus generation around validation of and institutionalization of vocabulary, terminology and technique as in who can identify as a trans person as per law, what are certification procedures required to change my documents to uh, that of a trans person or that of a man or a woman, what are the collaborations between law policy and medicine in this regard and so on. So I would say that in the study we witnessed the phenomenon of bodies being made medically legible as sites of identity crafting as trans masculine or trans feminine persons in the clinic. Uh, and I focus today entirely on the, what was happening in the clinic. So, so a making of gender again is what we uh, sort of that moment uh, was about. I say again because uh, we know about the histories and practices we already you know, see of gender being assigned at birth in the clinical setting uh, on a regular basis. Uh, we know about the histories of HIV intervention that have turned on the trope of risky sexualities. I'm seeking to intervene with behavior, but actually building societal and institutional memory and stigma around at-risk sexuality identities. So this earlier history marks the first time perhaps that sexuality enters the clinic. But what we are seeing now is another moment of crafting gender, binary gender in the clinic alongside law policy and nationalist consolidations of this binary by mobilizing specific myths around gender from an imagined past. So the trope of risk reappears as vulnerability and distress in this later historical moment is what I suggest. And my point is the following that these techniques, protocols, vocabulary are to be seen as norming technologies. And while queer trans inclusion understood as an expansion or a making space is being talked about as an amends to historical prejudice, if we see or if rather we know that exclusion is constitutive of norm building, then the norming is what needs attention. And this is also, I mean, I'm uh, grateful to Gita for having flagged this already, the point about uh, the nature of, uh, you know, science, for instance. One of the questions coming out of the study following uh, Anne Mary Moll's uh, idea of the politics of what, therefore, was what is, it, what is to be done? That means what kinds of revisions of the normative are in order as a necessary hyphen to challenging the dominant terms of representation? As, in, as a necessary hyphen to, uh, to you know, who speaks for the excluded or who speaks for the uh, exp uh, excluded experience. So in addition to the who, we need to talk about the what. So that's, that's the point I would, I'm trying to make. This need to revisit the parameters of knowledge building is one of the primary teachings of FSS work uh, to indicate the fruitlessness of doing only one or the other. And uh, I will only point to Longino's work on ontological heterogeneity and Banu Supramanian's own work on the politics of diversity as a, as a very quick uh, pointer to the kind of work that's been going on. And of course, there is much more also. Now, where would we locate these norming uh, technologies? It would seem that this is also a time when the clinic as such seems to be falling apart as an isolated physical site of expertise with the emergence of what Nicholas Rose calls somatic experts, both within and uh, alongside the medical apparatus. So you have genetic counselors, insurance officers, popular medicine writers, journalists, fitness trainers, patient forums, to name uh, but a few. So whether this means a democratization of medical authority or an extension of the expert domain is, is a question. But I think if we think through Rose on this, where he speaks of, and I quote, the vital politics of our century as concerned with our growing capacities to control, manage, engineer, reshape and modulate the very vital capacities of human beings as living creatures, close quote, then we might find some kind of entry points to understand how to read norming in this time of the clinic falling apart as it were. One way of saying this is that we are looking at active participation and consent in the regulation of health and fitness alongside other aspects of life today. So a particular kind of experimental subject to use Kaushik Sundarajan's term is born in this assemblage who has distress 
the subject, but who is also responsible for its eradication, providing that distress can be made legible in the clinic. And this is the context in which it becomes more difficult to name discrimination, actually, because distress appears as the more appropriate word. Uh, it is uniquely individual, not social, and in its interface with advanced technologized medicine, it can be represented as an aspiration towards enhancement. And it is in the context of this interfacing that I suggest norming technologies work. So I put to use two aspects of the refiguring of vital processes that Rose speaks of, susceptibility and enhancement, to understand this. Susceptibility, says Rose, and I quote, indexes the multitude of biomedical projects that try to identify and treat persons currently without symptoms in the name of preventing diseases or pathologies that might manifest themselves in the future. Enhancement refers to the attempts to optimize or improve almost any capacity of the human body or soul to open it to artifice and include its management within the remit of biomedicine from bench to clinic to master and marketplace. Close quote. I indicate a slightly different movement between susceptibility and enhancement here. Uh, susceptibility in the context that I have been exploring link to earlier ideas of predisposition and risk and pushed further back to stigma also. A uh, marker uh, of, you know, where you are responsible for your troubles, that kind of thing. Uh, so norming technologies uh, work, I suggest, to offer a movement from susceptibility to enhancement in the clinic. So movement from stigma, predisposition and risk to being made good as new. Uh, this is, of course, different from self-determination, which is the language of Nalsa. Self-determination is definitionally a challenge to the ways in which the dominant continues to occupy and construct the normative notion of identity. So, so this is what I mean. What I mean by you know uh, bringing norming technologies to the table to understand some of the context of these technologies. One is the reiteration of the biomedical setting as the valid site of intervention. One of the statements we heard from our study practitioners, therefore, was of gender affirmative surgical procedures being an alternative to what they called unhygienic, life-threatening, self-mutilating practices being conducted outside the medical setup. This is despite the fact that they themselves, these practitioners themselves said that these procedures are risky, they are prone to failure in hospital settings as well. But I suppose the, this failure uh, in the hospital setting was being presented as part of the experimental and sometimes cutting edge nature of the work and also meant as a deterrent to all but the most convinced, as it were. Another context is the constant iteration of the non-essential and, and non-reversible nature of these procedures. In other words, uh, procedures are being offered. Asha, you are on mute. Uh, um, yeah, I could see you on mute. Am I OK now? Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know what all is happening. Uh, <laughs> so another context uh, is the constant iteration of the non-essential, like I said already. So these are listed as uh, cosmetic. Uh, and they're placed away from core medical practice, which is about saving lives, which this is seen as not. So a deprioritization of gender affirmative work and a consolidation of what is seen as the real work of biomedicine. Also, although these procedures are seen as linked to gender, they are spoken of as failing the real gender test. In terms of sexual function and reproductive function is of course not an option. So it, it's interesting that for a science that has moved so far and so far from the natural in terms of reproductive technologies, this declaration of impossibility uh, in, ter in terms of gender affirmative surgeries is made so confidently, so easily. So maybe different kinds of prejudice are at work here, but the norming I'm speaking of operates at the edges then of both normative gender sexuality and biomedicine in terms of the binary appearance that can be promised. And that is where then the work focuses and proceeds. So that's the binary appearance. That's, that's all that is talked about. But this work does not, and norming does not, proceed in absolute cohesion or concert. Um, ad arbitrariness or ad hocism to varying extents seems to be a common element of the practice, whether it's feminization or masculinization procedures. Terms of entry into affirmative procedures vary. Sometimes there are demands to live in the other gender for extended periods with the naive assumption that the person self-identifying has not done so before first coming to the clinic. 
sometimes there is a resistance to the irreversible step uh, in, and why don't you take steps with appearance for instance one of uh, surgeon practitioners said at the other end uh, you find an advocacy towards enhancement so photographs of chiseled hypermasculine or feminine figures uh, on websites and in waiting rooms of private clinics uh, discussions of surgical procedure that take on board client questions on how the body and its parts will look, believe, uh, behave, feel post-procedure, with the highs experienced by both the surgeon and the client being shared in a moment of seeming solidarity. This desire for binarism is not simple heteronormativity at work, but it is the excited call to multiple technologies of enhancement within and outside the clinic to a myriad regulatory structures and strategies and so on and perhaps most importantly to the expert, redrafted as the ally all over again. Uh, so, you know, this is not old school discrimination. Uh, you see bodies and identities here as a new constituency that provide the testing ground for this group of practitioners to hone their skills to craft gender, what was until so recently impossible. With the work being spoken of as sometimes art, not science even, uh, we see then, uh, as one of the you know private, private cosmetic surgeons uh, in the study stated, we see a meeting of aspirations, as it were, of the expert and the client. So it would seem that in a manner of speaking, self-determination has now been enacted in the clinic for both. Another mobilizing of standards, and this is a more uh, you know sort of uh, difficult. For, it was more difficult for us to grasp. Uh, may be seen in terms of an attitude towards gender, towards gender difference and disease linked to what Pickering has called the performative idiom of thinking about science. So the normative attitude towards gender as binary and maleness as standard sometimes appears at, as a cultivated distance, sometimes as rampant masculinism. Uh, so in gender clinics, we see either this basket of options approach, we show pictures of several models, we ask what would you like, what kind of nose would you like, and so on and so forth, or we see a road full of pitfalls. Failure rates are high, you don't really need this, it is irreversible, and so on. The masculinism is, of course, more visible. Towards trans women, the attitude seems to be one of a simpatico, is a term that one of the surgeons used. Uh, towards trans masculine persons, the performance of the gender attitude is a little different. One narrative is that of the older patriarch who cannot believe that those who were in historically marginal gender locations in society as well as the medical universe now want to be men. I'm sorry, I mean, uh, if, uh, you know, this, this is a difficult thing to hear. As a surgeon in a municipal referral hospital with a history of HIV and gender identity work, so he's been through all of this and then he's saying this. Uh, the other uh, sort of masculinist figure is the genius surgeon and, uh, and like Geeta will have possibly some more to say on this, uh, who is not, who is the only one who can make this happen, if at all. So the stress on a risky learning on the job aspect, uh, sort of attributed to, to this figure. Uh, and uh, cutting across all of this, of course, is the principle of hegemonic masculinity and a certain holding of skill as power. Um, advanced surgical technique, working against nature, the iconicity and genius associated with that, while humbly referring to limits. We are more or less technicians. This is the same patriarch. The skill is near Brahminical in its manner of elevation and while ex uh, occupying expert domain is also beyond frames of accountability. So is there no standard then or is it just unevenly distributed across training and practice? It might be useful to focus on the relation between practice and protocol here. I I'll take about five minutes more. Is that OK? Yeah. Less than five. So I was just saying if it's an interesting conversation, so maybe we can allow a little more time. Uh, but I will take less than five. Right? Um, it is uh, so. So in looking at the relation between practice and protocol, that might be useful rather than looking at the split between. And clinical medicine is a particular space where this, uh, you know, happens again and again. And uh, so this this difference, distance between curriculum and practice also. And uh, I would say that it is in the museumized character of curricular language around bodies that are different in its unwieldiness. I mean, unwieldiness of the cu curricular uh, language or distance from clinical experience that the standard then gets excused from clinical work, substituted for by the genius and uh, his capacity to spot, for instance, a rare case of what he would call an intersexed individual and summon the unit in terms of students for training as experience in secret clinics. I believe this is common lingo uh, for exclusive training in rare cases in a fiercely competitive field uh, that is medicine. 
So it is also here that the standard, covert as it is, becomes impossible to dislodge. It is here also that the mismatch and chasm between curricular learning and practice become normalized, while curricular marking of deviance of certain bodies can continue to act as a reference point for the many micro discriminations evident even in the narratives I just brought up. So once this arbitrary, person-centric, feudal, hierarchical training is validated over and above curricular work, the inattention to curricular revisions, which we saw in the recent uh, revised medical curriculum, doesn't seem odd anymore. You know, the same uh, same uh, prejudices, the same uh, uh, like you know uh, uh, ancient kind of text had reappeared in the revised curriculum. Rather, we see that there is an institutionalization of arbitrariness uh, instead of a cre creation of a critical mass of trainees with perspective. In such a scenario, what is to be done? The normative question cannot be asked. It is of course asked and answered pragmatically, bureaucratically, who will certify, who will be family in a known scenario of lack of family support for transition. References to NALSA, WPAC protocols, DSM-5, community work on gender affirmative therapies are not, somehow don't appear in the picture unless via the labor of those who we identify as community in queer and medical parlance. So everybody knows what that means. So the queer or trans identified individuals, it falls upon them to bring in uh, some of these learnings. So where then do we place accountability and what is to be done? Is perspective almost only the burden and labor of those who occupy the expert domain less as educators and more as members of community, as our conversations with queer identified medical persons seem to show? Can this labor be resituated in research, in training, in practice, rather than treating it as a subculture in the clinical space. <coughs> sorry, Can this labor go into diversifying medical class classrooms and communities, offering scope for modeling and mentoring, which is like otherwise uh, absent? Can in other words, the occupation of the normative by dominant groups be dislodged somewhat? Can the normative itself be revised in history taking, case presentation, the orientation of treatment spaces? Can we acknowledge and recognize the clinic as a political space? What is to be lost if this is not done? Costs to those on the other side are well known. What of costs to medical communities? Apart from the costs of isolation of the few who do the gender work and the continuation of prejudice, the learning that is bound to accrue from asking the other question, as Mari Matsuda has told us, uh, the value in building a question, uh, the other question is in the question which has not been asked. Uh, the value in building a critical mass of members who would challenge existing models, all these possibilities are lost. Most importantly, the chance of learning about variation instead of about deviance is irrevocably lost. What might be gained if this normative is revisited? Critical lessons from HIV work have shown us that cis women in marriages, cis lesbian women in families, privileged caste clients of cis women in sex work all become visible once we are willing to give up on the target approach. Our conversations in the study showed us the possibility of thickening the context of the symptom by starting from experience with a chance to develop collaborative terminologies in the clinic and to keep them provisional rather than freeze them. We saw the chance to bring into epistemic presence on a regular and not rare basis experiences that have been invisibilized without calling them rare or new. Uh, as in the case of the uh, intersex variation, for instance. We saw the chance to recognize what Longino calls uh, ontological heterogeneity, that is recognizing variation in nature if knowledge communities are consciously made heterogeneous. So in asking the question finally of what is to be done, therefore we could ask questions of training for one. Is training meant for standardization? Since that has already been questioned with respect to critiques of universalism and so on, can we move towards provisional revised models of history taking, for instance, I would pose these as different from learning on the job. From the histories of collectivizing and critiques of institutionalization, we could also ask the question of these models needing to be collaboratively built with persons who are named as patients or clients, with other knowledge communities, including other academic disciplines and campaigns. Terminology is about self-identification rather than expert naming of persons or behaviors or disease and needs to be acknowledged as such. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asha, for such uh, insightful talk and sharing your work.
Uh, I now invite our third speaker, Professor Banu Subramanian. Uh, Professor Banu Subramanian is a faculty at Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is trained as a biologist and has been conducting pioneering research in feminist science studies. Her work explores the history, philosophy, and culture of natural sciences and medicine as it relates to gender, race, uh, ethnicity, and caste. She has published extensively on several themes and has been recognized for her seminal contribution to the feminist science studies subject. And in today's talk, she will discuss about decolonizing botany and elucidate on how science education in India reinforces Western and colonial history. So I welcome Professor, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? So um, yeah. thanks to Nimita and her colleagues for inviting me. And I'm just so thrilled to be on this panel with Asha and Geeta. And just as I expected, they were brilliant. And they both, I think, laid out the context um, of the field so well and sort of what the stakes are. And so I thought I would be provocative. And so I'm going to offer a fictional manifesto to show how we might embrace a feminist vision to imagine more equitable and just futures. So here goes. We are committed scientists from South Asia, a diverse group who came to the world of science for varying reasons. Some of us were drawn to science because we wanted to understand the world around us and science promised us the tools to do it. Others wanted to make a world a better place and science promised us that it had powerful structures to enable this. Others came because science promised us an equitable world where the identity of scientists was irrelevant. Science was objective and value free. Even those from social marginalized groups could participate in it equally and fairly. Yet others of us came to it because it promised us sustained employment and could help support us and our loved ones. After years of service to science and deliberations amongst ourselves, we are all disappointed. The institutions of science have not lived up to the promise of its possibilities. We join with global scientists who are working towards abolitionist futures working to undo the histories and ongoing practices of colonialism, conquest, and slavery. This much is clear to us. We recognize there are many colonialisms and that settler colonialism is well and alive in many parts of the world. Western colonial nations continue to control and shape the former colonies through neo-colonial economic and political policies. Science is deeply implicated in the histories of colonialism. Colonialism ushered in an extractive project that plundered the resources of the colonies to enrich colonial nations. This continues on to this day where the rich continue to exploit the resources of the poor. Imperialism, historians remind us, was in fact green imperialism, an ecological project to plunder nature's resources across the globe. But most importantly, colonialism was fundamentally a knowledge project a project that appropriated local knowledges across the world to be claimed under the mantle of Western science, a project that erased indigenous knowledges, science, wisdoms, theories, practices, and epistemologies. While people's independence and social movements contested colonial rule, in the end, it is clear that colonial administrators claimed enlightenment science as their own and instituted Western science as the system of legitimate and universal knowledge. Most tragically, science became an instrument to rationalize the violence of colonialism. In India, the British decimated social and political systems and recruited Indians to help the British run the nation. The biological sciences became critical knowledge machines that created hierarchies of gender, caste, class, race, and sexuality. The elite colonists, of course, were always pl placed squarely on the top of the hierarchy. The tragedy is that such Orientalism pathologized colonized people as inferior people. And even more tragic that this knowledge was institutionalized through science into governance structures and internalized within the psyche of the colonies. After independence, India was firmly gripped by a Western educated elite who in the name of modernity and progress imagined the nation in a Western gaze. Science and technology emerged as the reason of state and industrialization and scientific planning became the grounding logics for the nation. Most importantly, education systems and structures retain their colonial architecture to this day. 
So deeply implicated are we in the logics of science that we have embraced it as our savior. For those of us who make it into the hallways of science, so many of us have faced enduring discrimination, exploitation, hum humiliation, and marginalization. For complex reasons, some of us continue to labor under difficult circumstances. Others of us are refused and excluded. We leave. This exclusion ironically becomes transformed into a story about our incapacity, our lack of preparedness, our lack of networking, our lack of mentoring. Our absence is noted as a statistic. So confident and compelled is science in this enterprise that it bemoans its exclusions and develops programs for women, minorities, third world scientists. It is also clear that the overproduction of scientists keeps wages low. As scientists working towards liberatory ends and abolitionist sciences, we have to ask ourselves, why do we keep sending our loved ones into the belly of the beast? Why do we not insist that the problem is not us, it is science? Only when science changes, when it can acknowledge its history, when it can include the diversity that is us, only when it can welcome, encourage, and incorporate our diverse viewpoints, only then can we be happy members of that community. As practitioners of science, living in the afterlives of empire, we see empire everywhere. For example, archives and the rich resources of the colonies were shipped off to museums and repositories in the Western nations for analysis and research. Living in India, we cannot access our own history. Parachute science lives on, where Western scientists parachute onto third world nations to do research and parachute back, taking all the knowledge and resources. Our educational system continues to be grounded in the knowledge of the West. We are ignorant of our own history. So ignorant that when reactionary forces of the religious right invent new and false histories, we are quick to embrace them in the name of anti-colonialism. The past is not a figment of our imag imagination to make and remake willy-nilly, nor can the past be a salve for our wounded civilization. The past is a repository of our strengths and wounds. We must always be guided by rigorous method and methodologies and reckon squarely with our past. It is critical that we do this if we hope to understand where we come from and help us imagine abolitionist futures. To this end, we believe that Everyone can understand science. Everyone is capable of doing science. We must create the educational opportunities and possibilities for inclusive institutions. Second, we need to be better, we need to better understand and teach what science is and how science is practiced. Recent lessons from WhatsApp universities, even amongst the so-called educated, has been scary. Three, science is not a set of unbiased methods that produce truth about the world. Rather, it is a set of historically derived knowledge practices that elucidate the workings of the world. Four, colonialism has shaped our epistemes, methodologies, and methods. It shapes the questions we ask, the methods we deploy, the conclusions we derive. We must historicize science and understand where our tools come from. Only through decolonization can we ask different questions and produce new knowledges. If not, we remain bound to a colonial script. Five, colonial science was central to the shaping of human differences, the hierarchies of gender, race, caste, class, sexuality, and nation. We must always challenge the naturalization and biologization of human differences, be they claims of biological differences of gender or caste or race or class or sexuality or nation. Six, all students of science must be taught the history of the field. They must understand that science is produced by scientists who bring with them particular social, cultural, and political worldviews. These views shape the science they do. Seven, science is not democratic. Science is largely populated by members of socially dominant groups, men, upper caste, heterosexual, dominant religions, and the economically well-off. Not surprisingly, scientific knowledge continues to promote these very groups. Seven, despite these claims, most of science is no longer basic research. Science has become the handmaiden of powerful economic forces, and science has increasingly moved towards consumerist, nationalist, and other powerful forces. We must reclaim a science for the people. Eight, we must rethink science and take ourselves out of the orbit of scientism. Not every problem is a problem science can or must solve. We need to promote all approaches to knowledge and interdisciplinary approaches to questions. Science must not take up all academic spaces and knowledge practices. Eight, 
We must develop a science to aid people and the planet, not its wealthy funding agents and their profit margins. Science must solve everyday problems for all, not just produce products for the rich to buy. Progressive concepts like sustainability have been hijacked into neoliberal profit motives. As we work with global movements in a small gesture, we come together as scientists of South Asia. Our nations and national boundaries are themselves a colonial construct. Decolonizing means refusing colonial maps. We celebrate our differences in our unity. We believe the practices of colonization are too deep, too entangled in our world that we can never completely decolonize. Yet we must try. We must excavate our histories to understand why we inhabit a deeply unequal, violent, and inhumane world. Science has been mobilized into the necropolitics of the world. It can save lives, but in fact, it saves only elite ones. It produces weapons of mass destruction, increasingly aimed at the poor and defenseless. It produces gadgets and goods that help little, even while many more pressing problems loom. We live in a world where technology mediates the world with a growing number at its throes, schooled by the lies of WhatsApp University, numbed by soporific social media, increasingly isolated and individualized instead of seeking friendship and community. We remind ourselves that science is done by people. Scientific tools are tools of society. They can be used towards many ends. The world we have inherited need not be the world we live in or the world we leave to the next generation. We must work towards different futures every single day. Ends do not justify the means. Decolonizing is a practice of the every day, every experiment, every result, every paper, every person we meet. We commit to working towards an abolitionist science that unravels the histories of violence, of colonialism, slavery, and conquest, and pledge to work towards more equitable and peaceful futures. This is the promise of science that brought us here. We are scientists, we claim science, and now we must reclaim it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bano. This was, uh, I think everyone would agree, this was uh, a great, great ending to this panel discussion. Um, I think we need such provocative manifestos and statements coming across. Uh, the, I, and I'm glad that everyone is hearing this. Uh, people who work in policy and uh, they are somewhere being a part of this panel also feel that there is a need to what you say, decolonize science, reclaim science in, in the way you have put across. So, so thank you. Thank you for this. And I think we should make a poster out of it somewhere and, you know, just <laughs> circulate it across. Um, thank you so much uh, to all the three panelists. And with this, uh, we are not ending the panel discussion, but we are opening up the discussion further. Uh, so we welcome the audience questions now. We'll begin with the q and A. I could see two questions in the chat box right now. Maybe we could just do uh, those first and maybe we'll take up uh, the questions as and when it comes. I would request uh, the other uh, people in the audience, the participants, to kindly raise your hand, which will help uh, Debanjana and me to identify you. And you can come and on the screen and talk to the panelists and share your questions. So uh, the first question, I mean, it's not indicated to any particular panelist, so I'll open up this question. It is by uh, Rahul Mane, and he says, uh, did we ever have women SNT ministers at state and central government level? I don't know anybody till now, maybe my ignorance. Will it make a difference, by the way, in policy making? So this is a question by Rahul. Uh, I open up the floor if anyone would like to answer to this. Geeta? Yeah, so, um, you know, I don't know about the facts about whether there were or there weren't women. Uh, I mean, that can easily be checked up, but let me sort of answer this question in a more wider way. Um, this is a question that we come across even when we are talking about part participation in science. That, you know, will bringing more women in science make science more, uh, will it make it different? Yeah. So uh, it doesn't happen automatically. 
right? So when we are talking about a woman's right to become a minister of science and technology, that is what we protect, yeah? But the fact that she comes in uh, and immediately will take up uh, uh, gender specific issues is not a given. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, 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 why it's a tricky one. While we all stand for the right of women to be included, participating, uh, being more, uh, uh, you know, there, present uh, in making policy, in doing science, all of that, I don't think it's a given that automatically things will change. So we uh, we constantly take the position saying that uh, a, a feminist perspective or a critical consciousness comes in uh, with awareness, with uh, experience, with uh, association, with movements, with critical perspectives. It's a consciousness that can develop in men or women or anybody. Yeah. So I think uh, we need to keep that in mind and the onus on just a woman minister or a woman scientist to take up continuously the issues of women or gender issues is a very heavy burden. And that's exactly why we find a lot of women practitioners in science uh, are struggling, you know, with, with becoming the token woman, with having the burden constantly on them to take up women's issues and continuously then being ghettoized, not being able to do their science. So I'd, 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 uh, I'd say it's not a given. Uh, but if you ask me today, if there's a choice between voting for a woman or a man in any of these positions and everything else, we need, I definitely choose the woman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Geeta. Uh, we have another question for you. Uh, the question is from Dr. Ravi Srinivas. He is asking how feminist science studies can help in developing alternative pers perspectives in science policy, particularly in addressing access equity and inclusion in science. Uh, very obviously, in terms of, of course, uh, things like recruitment and recruitment policies in terms of, uh, uh, you know, making uh, uh, institutional spaces much more conducive uh, to the full participation of women uh, who are doubly, who are burdened also with a lot of care labor. Yeah. Um, looking at some of these questions is uh, very, very the practical questions that women practitioners of science face is, is something that feminist science studies would definitely uh, you know, give inputs into. But I think the inputs have to come from in a more fundamental manner. They have to come from uh, point number six of Banu's fictional manifesto. And the point Asha has been continuously talking through her talk is, uh, is to be able to look at curriculum, to be able to look at pedagogy of the way we teach science everywhere from school to university to uh, PhD scholars in research uh, institutes. Uh, we don't teach any history, philosophy, politics, anthropology of science at all. And I think if we start bringing that in, it's very uh, organic that hopefully other things will flow, like ask the question of why is uh, the kind of science that we do so uh, Brahmanical in India and why is it so, uh, you know, mm, Simple words like why is it so sexist? Yeah, why is it so androcentric? So the fundamental questions that we are asking, I think, will not just come. I think they need to be cemented and brought in at a very deeper level in the um, pedagogy uh, and uh, teaching and learning of science. Over the and so we can. I mean, what I mean to say is that we can keep on doing gender sensitization programs. Yeah, I mean, it's become the buzzword. No, everybody wants to do a gender sense. Scientific institutions also. That's fine. You can keep doing that. Yeah, and that's good. That's helpful. But I think if we really want to look at uh, structural changes, we need to get to the heart of the discipline. Yeah. It circles back to what you have been reiterating it again, because the nature of science has to kind of embed these ideas within that. And then only it may be made more 
equitable and inclusive, if I have to say. So thank you, Professor Geeta. Uh, so we have a raised hand before we reach back to the chat. Uh, that is by Vinita, if I'm not wrong. Vinita, would you like to come on uh, the mic or on the screen to ask yeah. a question? Hi. I am Vinita Gowda. I'm from Mysore, Bhopal. Um, so I'm a faculty here, and of course, uh, like what you said, um, we've been discussing or we've been trying to discuss the role of women and science, and it's very difficult because I am in a science institution. So pretty much everything that Professor Bano sort of bulleted, I think maybe I should just make a graphical image of it and put it on the wall because we understand graphs better than than words. Uh, and I'm very serious as much as it sounds humorous that uh, that that it truly I can I'm sure it will be a social experiment that whatever you said, if it was graphical, we will understand it. And uh, but what I uh, I have few questions sort of comments or maybe sort of um, thoughts on what uh, Professor Gita said, although I didn't mean it when I raised my hand is um, I do think that um, um, I mean, I don't know how to say the the issues of of equity. I also do think that institutions like ICERS, where we have a lot of undergrads, I feel is one of the place where discussing uh, gender equity is far more important than discussing with scientists. Because most of us, um, you know, arrive as scientists in their 30s, kind of our, you know, thoughts are, um, are, are formed. And then we, we're so busy sort of running the, the promotion sort of um, uh, race that by the time we get to breathe, especially women, we are already in our 40s, by which time you're in a different phase of life. So in some sense, I feel like this gender sensitization. Uh, I, so today, since because it was Women's Day, of course, a lot of students had a lot of, um, um, you know, uh, or tried to have panel discussions. And what I realized was that um, as usual, there weren't many men. Most male faculties didn't attend it. Uh, they thought it was a waste of time. Uh, they thought it was a discussion. It is, I mean, in this day and age, despite what all all institutions have been discussing, it's so uh, so much so prevalent in on social media as well. Uh, most of them still thought women should discuss women's issue because women know it better, um, and women is still a homogeneous sort of a structure and not a heterogeneous structure, um, and it everything needs to be said again and again and again and i consider this as vaccination now that you know it's like one shot is not enough so we go for two and then you go for three and then you go for four and i think as of now there's no number for it you know and and i do think therefore an institution like mine it is very important to just keep doing it again and again even if it sounds very tiring you know and and i hope that somewhere it clicks and maybe it will click with the students maybe my colleagues will realize that where i stand and therefore behave better you know it may be in many small forms so i i don't know i mean i kind of was thinking that it is a fashion and so that was one of the thing also the students said that oh it's 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 fashionable to celebrate the day and so some girl students said that oh therefore i don't want to do it and i said no i don't see that as 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 fair enough because a day was created because we don't celebrate it every day and it's perfectly fine therefore to you know sort of talk about women in science on one day at least let's start with one day and then you can do it for 365 days, you know. But my actual original question was for was for Professor Banu that uh, the bullet points that you mentioned, again, um, extremely important. But how often have you uh, presented this to scientists and scientific institutions and 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 they have understood what we are saying? <laughs> You know, because uh, I mean, for me, I feel like, you know, scientists are even tougher audience because they think they know. Right. Uh, so and we because we have the experience of of writing papers and, and, and of doing science and science is seen as the structured thing that we understand everything. So if you understand science, you understand everything. And that's how we've been taught science. So how do you see this not as a problem of 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 teaching and education? That is, you know, we don't question things, right? As as as, as 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 young researchers, we are told to read the paper as is and not criticize. Uh, and some of us who are extremely critical, and I think we we are good in what we do, is because that critical thought was at, was given to us very early on. And I'm realizing now that the critical thought is not so easy to instill in most people. Maybe it's because of our education system. So how do you see this? And so given that the population is predominantly into listening 
and not criticizing the bullet points that you raised how how um, sensitive are, are male and other gender um, uh, sort of peep scientists when you present this thank you for that <clears throat> i just want to echo you know everything what you said and geeta and asha said asha used this wonderful term somatic diversity and mm -hmm. to me that's what women in science programs do right we need different kinds of bodies but what we don't ask is how do we change the culture of science mm -hmm. because you know women are indoctrinated into the same culture men are and at least it, i know many women scientists who um are as mean to their women students as Absolutely. male scientists right so Absolutely. so it is about a particular politics it is about you know your vision of science and so i think here the questions are really about structures like how do we change the reward structures you change the reward structures people will change otherwise these become these um, very symbolic events that we do and you know maybe it's better to have the symbolism than not have it at all and so to me this culture of science is really important because i know lots of scientists who completely agree with me i mean i've developed my ideas in, you know in, in talking to these colleagues but yet there is no space in that weekly seminar when someone is talking about a uh, you know beetle reproductive cycle there there is no space to talk about these other kinds of issues so i think it's a structural question of how one makes spaces in lab groups in departmental seminars um, that these issues can come to a fore and very often and i think this is a point um, Geeta and Asha make that very often people keep quiet. I have something to say, but if I say something, I will be marked as the feminist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there will be, and so a, there's a lot of silence. Of, yeah. And so part of the reclaiming is about saying, we have to stop being silent. We need to mm -hmm. build these alliances, you know, build these networks. Mm -hmm. um, at, maybe it's at the international level, maybe at a college is too, you know, is too mm -hmm. small that people feel exposed, but we need to find strategies to be able to do that. And I think we have to stop looking for science and scientists to change. Mm -hmm. It Absolutely. matters to all of us, right? Yeah. If, if science yeah. doesn't change, its consequences is not just for science. It is mm -hmm. the fact that, you know, climate change is where it's at, that healthcare is where, where it's at. And as Benno said, opening up that COVID, the ways in which it has spread is because of a particular kind of infrastructure mm -hmm. that we have not had a say in creating. So I feel the stakes are too great. I think we all have to reclaim science. Mm -hmm. It's all of ours, you know, whatever your training is, whether one is inside, outside of science, academic or not. I think we mm -hmm. all have stakes in these questions. And I think as feminists, we, you know, have to reclaim it. Yeah, and, and just just a point I just note remember now from our morning discussion on campus is that <clears throat> the the uh, the misunderstanding is so high uh, among scientists that I think I heard it multiple times that um, well um, um, science is more is 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 more equal towards genders than any other subject and that you know in science we see very you know because we are scientists we know that this doesn't exist and i had to reiterate gently to reasonably strongly saying i think politics is probably far more equitable because you can be voted out in five years while in science you cannot I mean, you could be writing a very bad paper and you could be, you know, fabricating data and you'll still be there uh, while in, in politics you'll remove. So I think, you know, strongly that politics is probably therefore more gender neutral um, than science is. But I think it's, it's, this is sort of the rhetoric I'm hearing more and more as I read and think about it, that there's a huge divide among scientists of how we see gender. You know, and, and I and, think this is, I think, the core of what Asha and Gita were saying, too. It, it's that conceit that <laughs> science is objective. None of this matters. That's what allows this to, you know, powerfully continue on. And, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. We have quite a list of questions now, so we should go ahead with that. Thank you, Vinita. Uh, over to you, Debanjana. You want to take the next one? Yeah. We have a question from uh, Mohammed's 
Sajid. Uh, the question is, how do we democratize science? Uh, the question is like, uh, the only way, uh, he says, uh, how do we bring more people to research and science uh, scientist positions from underrepresented communities? So, and it's not directed to anybody. Uh, any of the panelists may take the question. Asha, would you like yeah. to attempt? Yeah, I just uh, I, I just wanted to say one thing that is, uh, you know, if the, the, the you know, the, to bring up more people from underrepresented communities, there are people from underrepresented communities and they are not being seen. They are not being heard. So uh, the point is, why do we assume that we are part of a very, very, you know, uh, that everyone is, uh, you know, a particular caste, a particular sexuality, a particular, and those who are not are those who are either regularly invisibilized or bullied or you know so so what is the experience of people who are inside there are people inside so i think that's i mean i don't think there is uh, you know we need to start the question from let's bring more people in the question is what are we doing to the people and with the people who are inside and Ami. i think it's really important gita started with the rohit vamula quote yeah. right so yeah. that's i think a powerful yeah. example of uh, yeah yeah and that's uh, somebody becomes visible only when they go when they when we lose them this Sorry, is an interesting geeta would you like to add something Sorry, yeah um, when it is just wanted to quickly say i absolutely uh, uh echo what asha and banu just said but i also think that uh, there are places where there is a need for affirmative action, much more than we have. Yeah. Okay, some of the lead research institutions that we have, you know, if you look at the um, composition of these uh, spaces, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, in IAC, whether it's TIFR, whether it's, uh, you know, even probably the IITs, IIT is probably less than the others. What we see is that uh, because of the lack of an affirmative action system, but also because of this whole idea that we work only with men. Uh, women are not there in physics or girls are not there in physics because but our entrance procedures are very, very merit-based and very open. Then obviously something else is going. Yeah, we are not responsible. So this lack of accountability and the lack of um, taking affirmative action uh, for uh, women and other marginal groups is very, very important. And also this whole thing about the iconic scientist. If you really ask people about institution building, the iconic scientists, why don't you hear about obesity? Something that I've been saying for a long time. Yeah. Why don't we hear about obesity? So I think I think there are multiple ways in which we need to actually open up also, along with visibilize people who are already there, who are all the time struggling to actually erase that idea. And, uh, so, yeah, that's all that I know. Thank you for, uh, I think, uh, I'm sure uh, Sajir would have got a response to uh, his question. Before we take up the next question, there is a comment by uh, Professor Abhinandanan, and he says, the, uh, I think, uh, particularly about the curricular design and how we can change uh, science from at uh, different school levels or within science education uh, in order to change the nature of science. He says that uh, in response to Professor Gita's comment that uh, it would be great if we can get some pointers to pedagogical or educational resources at the high school and early college level, especially on the philosophy and sociology of science. So I'm just leaving this thought with the panelists so that maybe uh, we can reconnect and uh, work on certain aspects. Yeah. Uh, Professor Abhinandan, I'm sure three of us can go on and on telling you a lot about that, but we shall reserve that for another conversation. Yes. There yes. are a lot. Great. Uh, so the next question is by Annapurna. Annapurna, would you like to come on, on the mic and talk or should I read? I mean, I'm good with that either way. So I believe she has left the question. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm actually in the middle of work. So I'll, I'll like it if you, would, you could read the question. I'm listening. 
Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Anupurna. Uh, she says that uh, uh, what can be done to increase the dialogue and awareness about science policy and research? I mean, in context to um, maybe the feminist perspective or beyond. And uh, because uh, she says that she is doing her PhD in biology and in, in her four years, what she has done, uh, she has never heard about policy research or uh, ideas of uh, sociology of science or history of science and all those aspects. So she she's just saying that it's a monumental problem. And I believe that we have been discussing in and out of that. So if you would like to add or reiterate some of your thoughts over to you. Uh, yes, yes, Asha, please. Yeah, I just uh, uh, wanted to add one little uh, bit here, which is that I think uh, this, you know, knowing about what's happening elsewhere, uh, which is the, you know, so this silos uh, form of education, which, uh, which you know, um, uh, is, is part of the problem. And interdisciplinarity is, is the, in that sense, has been one resource. Uh, through which, and I think the ICERs were, uh, you know, sort of imagined uh, that their origins were imagined in that way that they would do a better job of undergrad, uh, bringing in, uh, uh, bringing in uh, other, you know, bringing in social sciences, for instance, in the first year in a credited way, not just, you know, attending talks or auditing a few courses, which we find in a lot of science institutions. Um, so that, so that is one uh, route to, uh, you know, sort of learning about. Uh, Critic, uh, learning critical perspectives from other disciplines and that's one route to sort of looking at policy also um, I guess so that's I just wanted to add that of course today interdisciplinarity is going right out of the window in policy we are talking only about multidisciplinarity not interdisciplinarity uh, so that's that I don't know where it will go but Thank you for supplementing all the thoughts we have been gathering in, in today's evening. And uh, uh, so there are a lot of questions and we are already um, beyond time. Uh, so I'll ask the panelists if they are comfortable like going another seven to eight minutes with this. So if they're OK with it, we'll we'll just take like a couple of questions, two, three questions. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, so um, Debanjana, would you like to pick up the next one? Yeah, we have a question from Nikita. Uh, she is a scholar uh, in feminist science technology studies. Uh, whether Nikita, if she is here, she can ask the question. Um, she is eager to know how uh, critique of uh, how scholars of FSTS critique science without sliding into RW anti science discourse and relativism. It's not addressed to any panelist. So she wants to hear from all of you. So uh, any of you, yes, yeah. please. Yep. Asha, you're going first. I mean, after you, after you. No, so I mean, this is something that, uh, you know, when we started with the, uh, um, Feminist science studies, at least the earliest intervention that uh, uh, you know we did from here, uh, fell into the polemics of the science wars, which was basically to say, you know, if you critique science, then you are anti-science. And in India, it becomes harder because if you critique science, um, you're also anti-development, and then you're anti-progress, and you know, and then very quickly you are pro-right. This kind of uh, uh, um, unnecessary creation of polemic is what we have to guard against. And I think that is exactly what some of us working in FSTS uh, started understanding around uh, the early uh, part of the millennium. Yeah? That we need to sort of uh, protect uh, and continuously and rigorously argue saying that no, we are not anti-science, okay? That, but it depends on what we mean by science, yeah? We want to, so for example, to listen to Banu's manifesto very carefully. She ended by saying you want to reclaim the science, yeah? 
so there are various ways of looking at it ki you know if we are here we are here to reform it quote unquote and reclaim it yeah for a uh, purpose which is uh, in in conjunction with the feminist world view which is inclusive and that's why i like the fact that on the side of feminist manifesto but it's also a feminist utopia which we need to all reclaim that we are working towards a, a better world i mean however stupid it might seem to many people yeah but we are working towards a better world and in that we see science as an extremely significant way of um you know engagement human engagement with the universe with the nature with the world around us so i think we need to be very sharp with our vision developing in saying that feminist science criticism is well you know no time to take science and but we will fall into this all the time and you have to consciously uh not get intimidated by that Okay, I, I, can I just add one thing? Yes, I also yes. think that we need to recognize that there's been resistance to feminism. There's always been resistance to feminism, and this is another resistance. So this should not be a way to say we will stop critiquing. We are afraid of this. I agree with Geeta. We have to keep talking, but we need to. It's the same, um, you know, critiques coming from science, coming from the right wing. They're all the same purpose. Is about shutting us up, right? Mm -hmm. Shutting up any kind of critical in inquiry, and it's really important to keep at it. Can I add one? Yes, yes, Ansha. Please, please. Yeah. please. so just one a uh, couple of one thing uh, so i, I think uh, uh, if we look at scholars of fsts work uh, there is i can think of uh, literally one name which may slide into right wing which may qualify as right wing uh, you know disco or pro right wing or something like that but of the of the you know sort of the volume of scholarship coming out of feminist science and technology studies the work is not uh you know anti science it is not uh, relativist it is not uh, definitely not right wing so that's one the other point uh, so i i think in that sense the worry is something uh, different i mean like you know uh, so that's one uh, and i actually uh, agree with uh, subhani subramanian when you're saying that you know you it is the it is the it is a just a rhetoric uh, device used to shut up the critique the other thing is that the right wing whatever however we define it is actually not as anti science as it looks they are uh, quite interested in uh, you know uh, in spectacular technologies as you know nandi and others are, so they are quite interested in doing a selective uh, or saying that we are as good or we were the first. so there are variations of this but uh, the right wing is not really anti science so in that sense anybody who is saying that we are falling into that trap i mean it, it's not the case I, I think, I'm sorry. May I just yeah. add one point? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I also, I also want to say that one of the ways, probably, of uh, 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 you know, avoiding this problem of constantly being told that we are anti-science, is to keep showing what Asha was showing in her presentation. That you know, there is a different way of doing the science. Yeah. That we are not letting go. We are just saying, how do we do this differently? and i think if we develop that rigor in whatever area of feminist science technology studies we are in and to not just stop at critiquing but to also show how we are putting a different perspective yeah and that is also sense and value i think we might be able to uh, counter this problem in our own little domain where we face i think we Siketa has got her answer. Yeah, she she said that. Thank you so much for your response. And uh, um, with this, I'll quickly move to the next question. So Akash asks that how women in science in general is different from Indian women in science, and uh, adding to the geography and societal aspects. And I mean, he's trying to maybe contextualize the problem. or maybe asking questions that how differently one has to treat indian women in science so any reactions from the panelists
So, uh, I mean, I understand. Perhaps my reading topic. Gita and Asha's work because I think they've published a lot precisely on this topic. Yeah, I think uh, because uh, I mean, the the audience is a diverse set of people who may not be aware of feminine science, and the whole idea was to at least kind of open up this dialogue to create that sense that I at least make them unsettled and go back to reading these things also, because that is also important. And uh, and we are doing that. And I'm glad that people are even uh, coming up with nice questions, but make sense that at least they're opening up to discussions. So make sense for us. Thank you, Akash, for that. And I'll quickly move to uh, a question which says, uh, Okay, so this says that gender studies are being conducted in different fields of science nowadays in a relatively high volume. Uh, and especially in, uh, it's like interest in women representations have increased. <laughs> and uh, while in the current situation, what do the panel say in terms of what is the comfortable level of representation of women in the field of science and other disciplines? So, um, so yeah, he, he, Dr. Hirain wants to know the comfortable level of representation of women in the field of science. Over to you. Okay, uh, I'll just take that. Asha, come in, please. So, uh, firstly, to the earlier question, also, I request uh, uh, I request us to examine the notion of the Indian woman. You know, I think it's too homogeneous a notion. So, I think we need to be very careful when we use categories like, uh, you know, is the Indian woman in science facing anything different? Of course, in every cultural context, there will be a different. Uh, experience. Even in the Indian context, uh, there are multiple. Uh, so I'd be careful not to you know. And on this question of numbers, uh, see, we, we are actually doing very well with numbers in some fields in science. Yeah, actually. The question, however, is that that is not inferring in the whether they often there are women uh, coming from government cultures to start and religion and class. Uh, so we would definitely want to see more women from uh, other uh, marginal social sections. And uh, uh, I think it is less about numbers. It is about numbers, but it's less about numbers and it's more about actually looking at gender science. And it's so um, I I really don't think I can get anything about the optimum number. Can't hear. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I was just saying. Um, any reactions from Banu or Asha in in terms of I I, I saw Banu sharing uh, a good uh, reference point to begin with educating ourselves to uh, a feminism and science in India, and I think it's uh, it's a great book. I have seen that book. I've read that book, so I can say that yes. One should start from there. So yeah, definitely. And uh, I think uh, I'll just ask once again to the audience if they have any other questions. And I have plenty, but I would reserve my questions and I'll write to all three of you to answer to those questions. And with this, I believe we come to the end of the Q&A session. And uh, I would uh, definitely like to thank our panelists for creating such insightful, thought-provoking, provocative uh, assertions and, uh, you know, interventions. I think we all are uh, kind of intrigued, unsettled, and we are taking home a lot of things to reflect on for, for the night and days to come. 
and uh, it's important. So thank you to all three of you, Professor Banu, Professor Geeta, Dr. Asha for joining us and giving your valuable time. Uh, I also thank Benno, he left because it's uh, Bangkok time and he, it was too late for him. So uh, I thank Benno for joining and Dr. Suchiradipta for joining us today and uh, setting today's meeting. Special thanks to uh, um, Eric, UNESCO director and uh, Professor Abhinandanan, uh, who is the coordinator of DST, CPR, ISC, and a professor at ISC. And, uh, and uh, a loud shout to the organizing team. Uh, apart from me, there were people working at the back end, Soumya and Suresh, who worked rigorously back and forth on different aspects of uh, bringing this event together. And uh, of course, my co-moderator, Debanjana, and last but not least, the audience who, you know, stayed with us, uh, posed different questions of all magnitude and of all um, perspectives, I would say. So thank you to everyone. And uh, I would uh, say that we'll close this meeting. And this was an amazing discussion about not just thinking feminist science from the angle of, or say from a very dominant perspective, which we carry, but there is so much to learn from the plurality of, uh, of the discussions we have in terms of the intersectionality and how we need to change the nature of science. And I think a lot is being discussed and we have to keep re 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 uh, kind of re reflecting on what has been said today. So. Yes, thank you so much. And with this, we close the meeting and uh, very good night and have a good day for people who are starting off the day today and uh, have a great evening for others. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. thank you. Great to meet everyone. Yeah, lovely, lovely. It was lovely meeting everyone. Bye.